Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the American Floral Endow Endowments Grow Pro webinar series. I am your moderator, Dr. Mary Lewis. I am a YPC member and currently work for Syngenta Flowers North America as their tech technical scientist. Today's session is on biolo biological control of whitefly on poinsettias. Start your crop correctly. On behalf of the endowment, I'm excited, excited to be a part of AFE's Grow Pro webinar series that, fe that features a new topic every month presented by an industry expert. The webinars are free to everyone thanks to the generous support of AFE sponsors. This session is sponsored by BSA, BASF and Bioworks. BASF is a multinational chemical com company that creates chemistry for a sustainable fu fu future, combining economic success with environmental protection and social responsibility. BioWorks helps customers in the horticulture and specialty agriculture markets successfully deliver crops to market with biolo biologically based solutions and support. If you'd like to learn more about our sponsors, or if you are a supplier and in, interested in becoming a sponsor for a topic, you can find that information on AFE's website at endowment.org slash growpro. There will be a link in the chat. Today's session was pre-recorded in English by Dr. Rose Bout, Bout, Boutenhaus. After the presentation, Dr. Bout, Boutenhaus will join us for a Q&A. Feel free to submit your questions through the Q&A fe feature or chat at any time. We'll answer as many as we can before the end of the hour. Unanswered questions can, may be answered through a separate email exchange. This session is being record, recorded and will be shared to AFE's YouTube account. Through YouTube's accessibility fe features, you can access closed captions in other languages. To get us started, I'd like to share a bit about today's expert speaker, speaker Dr. Rose Bout. Boutenhaus. Dr. Rose Boutenhaus is a research scientist in biological control and program lead, leader of the Biological Crop Protection Program at Vinland Research and Innovation Center since 2010. She is responsible for the develop, development and implementation of bio, biological control techniques for the management of arthropod pests, supporting sustainable crop management practices for ornamental and production horticulture. Rose, welcome and thank, thank you for presenting today on the biological control of whitefly on poinsettias. All right, thank you so much for inviting me uh, to give this webinar. Um, this, uh, I'll, today I'll be talking about biological control of whitefly on poinsettia uh, and how to start your crop correctly. So indeed, in a bit more than a month, poinsettia cuttings will arrive in the greenhouse. So this is the perfect time to start planning your IPM program. Now the sweet potato whitefly, which is also called Bemisia tabasi, is a major pest of poinsettia. And in this presentation and the one next month, uh, my colleague Sarah Jandrisic and I will show how to manage this pest successfully with biocontrol. Using pesticides against whiteflies is becoming increasingly difficult and very risky, making biocontrol the most viable and economical way to control whiteflies. And this is because whiteflies have likely been exposed to multiple applications of several groups of pesticides in the field or at the propagator before they even enter the greenhouse. Now we all know that overexposure to pesticides is a sure path to development of resistance in whiteflies, and especially in the whitefly species referred to as the pew biotype, which is very common in poinsettia. So this means that by the time a poinsettia grower decides to spray a pesticide against whiteflies, it may not even work because of resistance, leaving no options for recovery. So in my presentation today, I will talk about whiteflies on poinsettia cuttings and what to do about them. Now, next month, Sarah will talk about how to continue the biocontrol program until the plants are ready to be sold. 
And I'll be talking about cuttings because one of the main entry routes of whiteflies is on propagative material. Despite the propagator's best efforts, small numbers of insects or mites are frequently present on cuttings received by the growers. And in particular, the white fly Bermisia tabasi is regularly found on Presedia cuttings. Um, we've had uh, the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture here in Ontario uh, has done a lot of scouting of Poinsettia cuttings over the years in Ontario greenhouses. And they've shown that infestation levels can vary year by year. In particular, 2012 and 2018 stand out as years with high white fly pressure. The white flies mostly came in as eggs or small nymphs, and the infestations were observed on many different cultivars. And in addition, the pesticide resistant biotype Q was often the majority of the white flies coming in on the cuttings. So what happens if these hitchhikers are not controlled? Of course, populations will grow rapidly and you'll soon have to start battling white flies early in the production cycle, which is far from ideal. The basic principle of IPM is to start clean and to stay clean. So that means to maintain pest numbers below an accepted threshold. Because once pest populations reach a certain level, the bios cannot catch up because the pests have had a head start on the bios. And in addition, any bios early in propagation may be affected by uh, pesticide residues on cuttings and may not perform their best early in the propagation. So in this case, you may have to spray a pesticide. However, as I said before, pesticides may not work due to resistance and they may cause disruption of bio programs that you may have in place against other pests. Luckily, there are things you can do to nip these pest problems in the bud or in the cutting in this case. So if possible, scout incoming plant material. So you have as much advanced warning of potential problems as you can. Find out what potential pests and pest stages look like so you know what you're looking for. You're probably looking for very tiny little things. Also use your experience with incoming cuttings to guide your actions. Um, from previous experience, you may know that some cultivars are more susceptible than others uh, and some places where pests always seem to show up first. Um, you're looking for very small numbers of tiny little bugs, so it may just be easier just to assume that the plant material will be infested when it comes in. And you can base this also on records from previous years to support this assumption. Now, there are several preventative options or approaches available. Uh, early intervention strategies include dipping cuttings, front loading of bios, so starting bios really early, and the use of soft pesticides or biopesticides that will support your biocontrol program. So for cutting dips, for those who uh, have never heard about cutting dips, uh, in principle, what you do is you take the cuttings out of the bag, spread them loosely in a perforated tray, cover it with a second tray and completely immerse it in the dip solution. Uh, for small quantities or tiny cuttings, some people prefer to use a colander, like the red thing that I put in the corner here. The products that we investigated in this research as dips were biopesticides or reduced risk products such as oils and soap. These products have less issues with pesticide resistance, also leave minimal residues and are very compatible with biocontrol agents. After dipping, the cuttings are just stuck like normal in the substrate and grown in the greenhouse. So when we started this research several years ago, there were a lot of things we didn't know about dipping, like what were the best products, what were the best rates uh, for efficacy, but also for phytotoxicity. Some uh, of the products may burn the leaves, for example. Also, we didn't know if the dips were really compatible with biocontrol. Um, if it works in the lab, will it also work in commercial greenhouses? Um, a, Important question we were asked often is how high is the risk of transmitting diseases through the dip suspension? And also does dipping make sense from a cost benefit perspective? So let's have a look at what we found in this research. 
Here, I listed all the products that we tested for efficacy and phytotoxicity. So um, there are several types of products. Of course, we had a water control uh, for comparison, but then we looked at oil products such as Sophil X at different concentrations in red, uh, insecticidal soap such as Copa uh, at um, the rate of 0.5%. And then in green, you see all the biopesticides, such as Botanigard, uh, another entomopathogenic fungus, no fly, nematodes, um, and combinations of the oils and the soaps with various biopesticides. So this graph actually shows the percent of white flies that survived after dipping. You can see there's letters above the, the bars, and those indicate which treatments were different according to the analysis that we did. On the right, the most rightmost bar is the control. So you see that uh, it's very high, almost all the white flies survived, and we gave it a letter A. Um, the best efficacy, so the lowest bars, um, were with um, Sofol X at 0.1%, and COPA, the combination of COPA and Botanigard. Um, these have the lowest bars and they also have the letter D actually associated with it, which is very different than letter A. So that means that they were uh, very far apart. We also saw no residual effect after the dip. So after dipping, if there were still a few white flies left, they would uh, multiply again um, as normal. Um, and the dips were compatible with parasites. Now we found some effective rates such as like mineral oil, uh, soft oil at 0.5% and higher, but those rates were phytotoxic. So that's why I'm saying that soft oil at 0.1% uh, was the best. Then we wanted to apply it to, uh, to real plants and combine it with, follow it up with biocontrol after. So what we did was we infested um, plants with Bermisia tabasi. Uh, these plants were the cultivar Prestige Red. Then we uh, dipped the cuttings in uh, the combination treatment of Copa with Botanicard. And just to be sure, the Botanicard, always when I say Botanicard, I mean the wettable powder formulation because the oil formulation um, may have a different effect and, and may be phytotoxic to certain plants. And then we followed it up with biocontrol, either with parasites, uh, the parasoid Arabnoceros aramicus, or with the predatory mite Amblyseus swirskii. So what happens uh, is shown in this graph. Um, we did not include a treatment with no dips and no bios because basically the white flies would have uh, increased exponentially. Um, so what we see is that with biocontrol alone, which is the dotted blue line, we can see that white fly numbers increase steadily. Um, so that was not very satisfactory. The dip, um, which is the uh, solid yellow line, um, knocked back the white fly. Um, but after a few weeks, um, you can see they started to increase again. Now dips followed by biocontrol resulted in the best white fly control, which is the dotted yellow line. And uh, either we did, if we did uh, the parasites or the predators, uh, we actually received um, very similar results. So then we went out into uh, commercial greenhouses to see uh, how it would work on uh, the, an actual uh, commercial scale, right? So we went out to three commercial greenhouses and um, asked them to dip at two different dates uh, their cuttings. We dipped about 2,000 cuttings uh, and then we left 2,000 cuttings undipped for comparison and we scouted every two weeks. These graphs may be a little bit small, I hope you can see it, but uh, basically um, this is the number of white flies over time per week for three different greenhouses, A, B, and C. And the dark bars are the dipped cuttings 
and the light bars are the undipped cuttings. So you can see that uh, the light green bars, which are the undipped cuttings, generally had more white flies than the dark green bars, which are the dipped cuttings. So it uh, worked most of the weeks uh, in most of the greenhouses. Uh, in addition, uh, the 2000 dipped cuttings looked the same as the 2000 undipped cuttings, so we saw no effect on plant growth. The other thing that we uh, looked at in commercial greenhouses um, was a question that we got a lot. Um, was actually the concern that uh, infected cuttings could um, transfer disease to healthy cuttings through the dip. Um, and for Porcetia, the main concern was soft rot causing bacteria such as Arrhenia, or as it is called now, Pectobacterium. So um, in those, uh, in four different greenhouses, A, B, C, and D, um, we actually uh, took samples of the dip solution um, from the source water uh, before any cuttings were dipped, uh, while the dipping was going on, and after the dipping was uh, finished uh, for different for two different occasions in each greenhouse. Um, so in this graph, you can see that um, the source water did not contain any bacterium, which was great news. However, uh, the column pre-dip, you can see uh, that at some greenhouses, even before any cuttings were dipped, there was already some pectobacterium um, in the dipping solution. And this was probably because the dipping tanks were not cleaned properly. Um, for example, you can see it in, uh, especially in greenhouse C and D. Um, and then in the next column, during the dip and after the dip, the last column, these numbers actually increased um, because uh, the, there was some pectobacterium on the cuttings. And these numbers increased to, uh, to for example, um, more than um, 2.5 um, times 10 to the fifth. So that's basically more than 100,000 colony forming units, which is kind of the spores of the um, pectobacterium. So, uh, definitely cuttings can contribute uh, some of the bacterium to the dip solution. Now it's important to note that this kind of bacteria can be found on many surfaces in the greenhouse, not only on cuttings. So uh, it's always important to uh, have good sanitation practices to prevent accumulation of these bacteria. Now, as I said on the last slide, it's also interesting to note that no disease was observed in the dipped cuttings. So these numbers, which seem very high, actually uh, did not seem to lead to any disease. But to confirm that, we did an actual experiment in the research greenhouse um, to determine kind of what level of bacteria in the dip solution can actually infect healthy cuttings. So, um, the treatment number three with the arrow, that's the kind of the level that we found in the, in the commercial greenhouses after all the cuttings were dipped. Um, and then we went to higher concentrations and lower concentrations. Um, so basically we went from no bacteria to uh, pectobacterium soup, unrealistically high numbers. Uh, to, and then um, we, dipped uh, two different varieties, Prestige Red and Freedom White. Um, we also had a treatment where we um, actually injected the Pactobacterium into the cutting because we wanted to confirm that uh, we had an infective strain of the Pactobacterium. And everything was replicated and repeated uh, to make sure that what we saw was actually happening all the time. So again, here's a graph um, which shows uh, the percent diseased cuttings on the y-axis and then the different uh, concentrations of pectobacterium uh, on the horizontal axis. Now on the far right, those were the cuttings injected with pectobacterium and they did develop a lot of disease showing that we indeed had an infective strain of bacteria. We can also see that the dark bars, which are prestige red, um, sorry, I'm, again, 
the light bars, which are prestige red, are slightly higher than the dark bars, which were freedom white. Um, so prestige red is just a bit more susceptible to pectobacterium. And even some of the non-dipped cuttings and cuttings dipped in clean water develop some disease, very low levels. Now, second, uh, the disease incidence did increase with increasing pectobacterium concentrations in the dip. However, if you look at the different letters, and here you want to um, compare the non-dipped cuttings, which have the letter A and B, with uh, the higher concentrations, you can see that uh, the only uh, statistically a significant difference was seen at the highest concentration, basically the pectobacterium soup, that really high unrealistic concentrations. So in other words, this was the only treatment where more disease was found as compared to the other treatments uh, that were all the same uh, as the control. So in conclusion, this basically demonstrates that the risk of pectobacterium transfer among rooted cuttings through the dip is quite low. But you never, uh, there are bacteria present as, as you saw, so strict sanitation practices are still important. Now, I don't really have time to go into the details of the cost-benefit analysis, uh, comparing biocontrol alone, uh, DIPS and biocontrol program, and a chemical control program. So um, we calculated the expected net benefits per pot. So based on the cost of the product, labor, losses due to pests, and the total value of the crop at sale, we found that all three strategies basically yielded net benefits that were very close to each other. Um, adding dips to biocontrol actually yielded slightly higher net benefits by four cents than biocontrol alone. Chemical control did yield the highest net benefits, uh, again, by just by a margin of four cents. But this calculation actually did not take into account the risk of pesticide resistance. So uh, it does not take into to account that uh, if you spray, there may be a risk that the insects are resistant and the spray may not work. In this scenario, the sprays did work. So in general, you can see that dips are kind of like a small insurance premium that reduces the risk a lot. Uh, in bad white fly years, it really pays off to knock back those white fly numbers to start clean. And in years without white flies, dips do not add much costs. So when we look back at all the research that we did, um, we found that dips can effectively suppress white flies on unrooted poinsettia cuttings. We've seen that dips are compatible with biocontrol agents and actually improve the overall biocontrol program just because it sets the clock back on those white flag populations and gives the biocontrol agents time to start working. Um, we also saw that the risk of disease transfer is low in poinsettia, but that good sanitation practices, of course, are very important. And finally, the cost benefit analysis showed that dips make sense economically. So we finished this research already a few years ago. And as a result of this, um, our data has been used to add dipping to uh, the product labels as an application method. And especially in Canada, there are now four products that can be used as dips in several ornamental crops, including poinsettia, such as uh, landscape oil, botanic art, wettable powder, copa insecticidal soap, and suffol X. As far as I know, in the US, uh, only Botanic Art has dipping on the label. Uh, the uptake by growers has been great, and uh, we've already seen the impact uh, because dips have helped mitigate high white fly numbers on poinsettia in uh, high white fly years, such as 2018. And even last year, some uh, cuttings came in with high white fly numbers, and the dips really helped to mitigate that risk. Of course, uh, we don't have all the answers yet. Um, there are many crops and many pests um, that offer um, also opportunities to use dips. Um, there's more products that need to be tested. Um, 
the AFE has actually funded uh, dipping research on thrips, um, and uh, it works very well, again, uh, for thrips on chrysanthemums. But there may also be in the research uh, and opportunities for automation of the dipping process and integration with production practices. So uh, there's still a lot more things that can be done. Now, I would like to, uh, in my last few slides, I would just like to give you a few um, uh, pointers uh, on how to dip, right? So um, definitely check the product labels to ensure that dipping is included as an application method uh, for where you are. Um, know that dip rates are lower than spray rates, especially for things like soap and oil to prevent phytotoxicity. And it, it's probably a good idea to test a small batch of cuttings um, before committing to a full dip program. Um, total coverage of the foliage is required. Uh, it's important not to pack the cuttings too tightly and uh, you check for dry spots after the cuttings are dipped because you want that total coverage. Again, I have said it several times before, good sanitation is essential. Change the dip solution regularly or when it gets dirty. And also when cuttings are obviously stressed, um, they may be more susceptible to disease. So then in that case, it may be better not to dip them. And then for your reference, um, we made a short video explaining all this information, the important steps of cutting dips. Um, we, you can find it uh, if you want to see it again on the Greenhouse Canada Environment Research Innovation websites. But right now I'll show you an excerpt of, uh, of that dipping video. Make sure the dipping tank is clean. Fill the tank with clean water and mix in the products. Here we used Copa insecticidal soap and Botanigard wettable powder. Mix the dip thoroughly. Spread the cuttings loosely in a mesh tray. Cover the cuttings with a second tray. Immerse the trays completely in the dip suspension. Gently move the trays around in the dip for at least 5 to 10 seconds. If you've done it right, all cuttings will be wet on both the upper and lower leaf surfaces. Do not pack cuttings too tight and do not compress the cuttings while dipping. Pests need to be contacted by the dip for products to be effective. There should be no dry areas after dipping. Many products tend to settle on the bottom of the tank. It is important to stir the dip frequently to keep the products in suspension. Prepare a new dip regularly to avoid potential accumulation of plant pathogens. Do not keep the dip suspension overnight and use the following day. Disinfect and rinse the dipping tank and equipment before a new dip is prepared. The risks of disease transfer using this technique are low, especially if you follow sanitation practices outlined earlier. Following dipping, cuttings are stuck as usual. And also, I'd like to end with a few uh, um, instructions on how to test dips yourself, uh, because you may want to uh, do some trials in your own greenhouse, and especially to test for phytotoxicity on the crop um, uh, that hasn't been tested yet. So first of all, don't go all in with your entire crop. Uh, just test a few smaller samples first. For cuttings, we recommend samples of about 10 to 20 cuttings. Uh, second, uh, you want to repeat uh, the treatments, so replication, to make sure that the results were not just due to chance. So do at least three samples of 10 to 20 cuttings per product or per rate. 
Also, uh, do not assume if dipping was okay for one variety or crop, that it will be okay for all varieties and crops. Um, so uh, test different uh, varieties for the susceptibility. And finally, things like environmental conditions can change over time. So it's good to repeat the test at a few different time points. Now, third, make sure to include a non-treated control. So either cuttings dipped in clear water or not dipped so that you have something to compare to. And finally, uh, figure out what you want to measure and what you want to quantify. This could be leaf surface area affected or a damage scale. And because although you're not going to publish the results in a scientific journal probably, just eyeballing the plants uh, won't give you uh, convincing results. Um, then it's just like, oh yeah, there was a difference. And someone asked like, well, what was the difference, right? And of course, uh, we're always here to help uh, or an extension specialist may be able to help you with this as well. So this has been a lot of research over many years and there have been many people involved uh, in this research um, and also the companies on one of the next slides uh, that's helped fund this, uh, this research in the funding agency and the AFE, of course. So thank you for the hard work, your support and your involvement in the project. Um, here is my email address. Um, if you uh, have any questions, uh, that you uh, are not able to post in the chat uh, during this webinar. And uh, thank you so much for listening to my talk. All right, thank you, Dr. Rose, so very much for your presentation. And this time I will go ahead and start the Q&A session now. So, all right, our first one to kind of go through is all right what would you consider to be an acceptable number of white flies either adults or nymphs which is considered below the economic threshold level when it comes to in terms of scout scouting and getting ahead of a pop a population before it explodes beyond your control yeah thanks um i would argue that um the threshold may change over time, right? Uh, to, because poinsettia is a quite a long crop. You started in June and you sell your plants in kind of November-ish. So um, if you already start, start with, uh, with white flies um, and you are not able to control them, then uh, they will get out of uh, control quite, uh, quite quickly. Um, usually, and Sarah Jandresic in the next webinar will um, talk about this uh, probably more in more details, but around this kind of this point uh, at the end of September, beginning of October, that you have to really take stock and say like, um, she will explain that the threshold is about 20% of your plants if they have white fly or not. It's just presence absence. But around that 20% mark, um, that's kind of where you have to decide if you have to switch from biocontrol to um, pesticide applications. Um, because in October, you still have time to do uh, some applications um, of pesticides if necessary and get those white flies under control. Um, so that's, that's kind of the, uh, the numbers that, uh, that we use here with the growers here in Ontario. So then kind of going on to the next step in that process, and now, now that we know the, thresh, the threshold ish, um, what is the actual process of happening to the eggs and the nymphs once dipped, once the dip is applied? Like what does it, what does it actually do to help kill off the pests that you're looking at? So depending on the product, like oils, like Sulfur X, or uh, we have landscape oil here in uh, Canada as well, those um, suffocate the, um, the insect. Uh, it even works for thrips eggs, actually. I was uh, happy to see that the thrips eggs uh, are covered and it um, apparently they still need some, uh, some breathing room. So uh oils suffocate mostly there's some toxicity as well soaps mostly work by toxicity 
Um, and then the botanic art, of course, is, uh, is an entomopathogenic fungus that colonizes the inside of the insects and releases toxins there and does all kinds of interesting things. Now, what we found is that uh, the soap and botanic art combination actually works really well, be better together than separate. And I don't know exactly why that is, but I have a feeling that uh, it either helps the spores of the botanic guard kind of get into the insect easier or that it acts as a surfactant. But uh, soap and botanic guard, especially for white flies, go very well together. So I'm guessing um, that when it once you are done dipping all of your cut your cuttings into solution, that you should not be rinsing them off afterwards. Correct, like you should just be letting them go, or would you suggest a rinse after doing the five to 10 second submersion? Sometimes, especially with the oil, you see it suggested that to rinse the cuttings, and that is mostly to prevent phytotoxicity. Um, in all our trials, uh, we did not rinse the cuttings after dipping in oil. Um, we used rates that were low enough to not cause any phytotoxicity. Um, I would not rinse uh, anything uh, if your dip is based on soil, on soap, sorry, or on botanic art. I would not rinse that off, indeed. All right, so kind of a similar question, but a little bit further, further down in the process. Would you need to observe the REI time, or can you dip and immediately stick since you are using different chemical pro products? Right, that's, it's, um, that's a good question. Um, I would definitely use all the PPE required. So the people uh, sticking the cuttings, um, you would uh, want to uh, use gloves probably and make sure that it doesn't get into eyes. And I guess, again, it depends on the product and um, uh, on, um, on what's, what's written on the label. Speaking of what's on the label, the label. So, what would you typically do with the extra dip solution at the end of the day, or after you're done doing your like three or four sets of cut cuttings, and as you change it out? Yeah. So, do definitely don't keep it until the next day or anything. Um, what I've heard some people do is uh, actually spray it on um, a crop that's um, also um, needs some some attention uh some people have been spraying it like on the on the landscape outside on their flowers uh, outside um yeah it's it's definitely a big chunk to go into your pesticide disposal tank um it will fill it up quite quickly our greenhouse manager actually uh, said like what are you guys doing <laughs> um so if there's um a uh, convenient way to uh, use it uh, and use the residual kind of insecticidal properties that it has on a crop that uh, can can handle it. That would be the best option. So, um, if that is the case, do you, do you know if there are any companies to contact for help with like the auto, auto, the automation of this whole dipping process, where they will handle all of the disposal for you, and all you have to do <laughs> is give them your pod, your products to dump. <laughs> for disposal, I don't know, but. Um... Yeah, nowadays there's these um, robots that can stick the cuttings for you um, and there's cuttings in clips and, and all that kind of stuff. So um, we have to make sure that these uh, robots can handle slightly moist cuttings or um, uh, that it's just compatible. So um, yeah, I, I don't have any recommendations of companies saying like, oh, these people will help you with with dipping, but uh, I merely indicate it as, as something that we should look into for future future research. Speaking of future future research, has Velifer been trialed as a dip yet? Um, not that I know. Um, I mean, it's uh, it's very similar to Botanic Art. Well, <laughs> probably uh, the company won't like me saying that, but. 
not that I know, but I don't see a reason why it shouldn't work uh, as well as uh, in uh, the, Bo the Bovaria bassiana in our research. Um, do you have any experience using leaf shine and seal pro product for dipping specifically? Um, so that would be, again, one of those things, you know, there's, there's a lot of products that we can try. There's a lot of pests that we need information for. Um, so I haven't looked at, at leaf shine or, um, uh, or any of that. Um, if you're interested, uh, definitely uh, do a little trial and, and see if it works. Uh, we're actually now looking into uh, clean grow um, if, if that has any uh, utility as a dip for spider mites. Okay, very, very nice. Um, kind of also going off of, off of the beat, beat, beaten path, would it be any benefit or knowing um, having a success on a hot, wa wa a hot water treatment by emerg emerging cut cuttings into hot water for long periods to control white fly? Yeah, hot water treatments are, again, a very interesting uh a disinfection method uh, that definitely works. Uh, there's a few challenges with hot water treatments is that it takes quite a long time um, to, uh, to treat the cuttings. Um, so, and you have to keep the water at that specific temperature um, for about 30, 40 minutes, which can be a challenge um, when to keep it exactly at that temperature, not too hot, not too cold. Like too hot, you get phytotoxicity. Too cold, uh, it won't disinfect the cuttings, but um, it would leave no residues, no problems with uh, disposal. So um, I find it uh, very interesting. Maybe someone should develop a, a machine to, to do exactly that. But it would be more of an investment, again, for a grower to, uh, to get that piece of equipment. So kind of going a little bit backwards into your talk a bit um, on the whole cost ben, ben benefit anal analysis. Uh, is there anywhere where we, if someone here want, wanted to access it, to read it, to get more in-depth information on what you discovered during that peer, peer, peer period, is there anywhere that they can go or anyone they should con contact? Yeah, we can... Uh, uh... I can see if I can find uh, like the assumptions that we used and uh, some more of the details and, and share it directly with the person who's interested. Okay. Um, we basically asked a, uh, an economist uh, specialized in agriculture um, to do this analysis. And she asked us lots of questions about the costs of products, about how much time things like spraying, dipping, uh, and releasing biocontrol, uh, how much labor it would involve, and uh, did the calculation from there. And then we based kind of like, uh, we made some assumptions about how many losses we would have at the end, so how many plants would be lost, and um, uh, then she came up with the magic number. That is very impressive. <laughs> um, let's see. So just a few more questions to go through. So besides poinsett poinsettias and white flies, have you investigated dips for other crops and pests? Yeah. So we have looked at uh, a few different crops and they basically fall into two categories, like the really sensitive crops like poinsettia. Um, uh, that definitely you need to use low rates of soap and oil to prevent phytotoxicity. And then there are the hardier crops like mandevilla, chrysanthemum, that can actually support uh, a bit higher rates. And then the main pests that we looked at are um, thrips, white flies, bemisia, tabasi white flies, and spider mites. Um, and especially for the thrips and spider mites, uh, the oils seem to work really well, the mineral oil-based products, as well as for thrips, the Botanic Art worked really well. 
but botanic art again didn't work for spider mites. So depending on the crop and uh, the pests that you want, or the pests, multiple pests that you want to control, um, you may want to choose different products. Gotcha. Kind of going off of that, um, is it possible to dip root, rooted cut, cuttings or does it have to be only unrooted cuttings? Yeah, all our research has been on unrooted cuttings um, when they come in from the from the prop, uh, from the overseas from the propagator. Now it is possible to dip rooted cuttings, although it may be a little bit more messy because you have that little root ball attached to it. You also have to make sure that the um, the products that you use will not interfere with rooting and a lot of that soil may get into um, into your solution so it, it it may be much messier um, one thing if you grow in these strips you can kind of turn it upside down and only dip the foliage um, and i know of uh, quite a few growers who double dip their cuttings so first when they come in as unrooted and then again when they are rooted um, and when there's that bit of substrate available, you can also add things like nematodes or trichoderma um, and other things that you want to uh, get started into the, the root zone. So there's other possibilities, but uh, I haven't personally done the research on that. All right, so we're down to like our last few questions. So if you have any more, if you can feel free to put them into the chat or the Q&A function. Um, some of these last lessons are, so what are the best practices for make, make, making sure you don't inadvert, inadvertently spread other diseases to your poinsettia cuttings while using these dips? Besides yeah, so, just sanitation. Mm -hmm. Sanitation, yeah, we looked at one of the the worst spreaders, so Pectobacterium or Arwinia soft rot, uh, is is known to spread really easy through splashing and through water, um, but definitely sanitation. If you can see the disease on the cuttings, don't dip them. Um, if the cuttings are stressed, don't dip them. Um, but if the cuttings are fresh and healthy and uh, your solution is is nice and clear and you use good sanitation practices, um, I think the risk is low. Kind of going off of that, can dips decrease chemical residues that come in from like a previous supplier? I try to find that information. Um, some, so I, Obviously, I, I didn't find the right information, but uh, somewhere I heard that the high pH of like soap may break down pesticides faster, um, but I couldn't really find any scientific references that I can cite to really prove that that's uh, a thing. Um, but I've, I've heard it mentioned and it may be possible, but unfortunately, I don't have any information to back up these statements. Gotcha. Because, yeah, that would be great, right? Because then you would reduce the residues and then you can use biocontrol agents and they won't be affected by the residues, which would be a, a really good win-win situation. It would be. It would be nice if things just worked out the way we needed them to all the time. <laughs> Yeah, so if anyone can find information about that, please share it with me because that would be uh, would be great. And then the last question I have for you today. Uh, so back in one of your slides, you had mentioned in the cost Ben benefit analysis specifically that there was a four percent or a four cent higher cost to using the biocontrol method. Was that on a per plant basis? Was that on like a square foot basis? In what way was it deemed to be four cents? Yeah, that was per pot. So the expected net benefits, uh, we came out with like the, how much profit would be made on the pot, on the per pot basis. And then um, the, uh, if biocontrol only was used, um, um, there would be four cents less profit than when dips and biocontrol were used. 
Um, and then the chemical control, uh, if everything goes well and there was no resistance, then chemical control was slightly cheaper or you would, a grower would have slightly more um, profit on those pots. But uh, again, when the chemicals don't work, then uh, that's not the case at all. So gotcha. Thank I think you. the main message really was that there were very slight differences. Um, so uh, it makes sense just to uh, to to go all in. I mean, if as long as you can have some insurance to avoid potential increase of yeah, has to be yeah. Of, exactly. of, tol of tolerance, trying to avoid that if at all possible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. So doc Dr. Rose, I would like to thank you and everyone else here. I'd like to thank you for joining, for joining us for another se session of AFE's Grow Pro webinar series. <laughs> Join us next month for Dr. Sarah, Sarah Dandrisic's presentation on developing an integrated pest control program for white fly on Point Sanias on Tuesday, June 21st at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You can re register at endowment.org slash growpro. While you are there, check out our past webinar recordings, other grower related resources and research reports available to you for free. Thanks to in industry support. Uh, we ask that you please complete the brief sur survey about today's session where you can suggest additional topics and help us continue to improve these webinars. Thank you again, both to you, doc doc Dr. Rose, and to all of our guests here for, join for joining us. Have a great day.